Hello and welcome to Property Question Time. I'm Stephen Galpin and this is the show where you can have your property related questions answered by our team of property experts. Joining me today is Sally Wang, founder of SJW International Property Experts. Welcome Sally, good to see you back again. And Richard Murray, CEO of Eurolink Technology, suppliers of Vico Property Management Software. Welcome to you, Richard. Good to Thanks see you back. Likewise. Uh, great, so we're going to get straight on with the question. And Sally, you're going first. I'm currently designing a small development of apartments in outer London. I've been advised by my agent that Hong Kong is still possibly the best opportunity for attracting buyers. However, if that be the case, there are some do's and don'ts in terms of superstitions, like certain apartment numbers to be avoided and the aspect of the property. Can the panel help with any advice with these points, please? There you go. I couldn't have anyone better to answer the question. Um, yeah. So um, if you have a, if you have a small development outside of London, um, on top of the superstitious thing, um, you probably uh, my advice is probably check the location as well. If you want to mainly attract the Hong Kong buyers, um, last year this year is BNO Hong Kong buyers coming to the UK. So we're looking. They are looking at places with. Big space, open space, good schools around it. So places like Sutton, um, Collingdale, those are the areas they really like. So uh, and also Richmond, Wimbledon, those are the areas they like. Uh, secondly, is the price, the price range. Um, my experience is that these group of uh, BNO buyers, um, most most of them are looking at five hundred thousand, six hundred thousand, seven hundred thousand. So not many of them go beyond one million. So those are the price ranges you probably want to look at. Then we move on to the subsidiary uh, side. I'm from mainland China, so Hong Kong, uh, but I do have a Hong Kong uh, colleagues, and we have now we have a Taiwanese uh, colleagues as well. So it's very interesting to hear them. Uh, they are slightly different from the mainland Chinese. Okay, so Hong Kong buyers they don't like anything associated with death. So number four. In Chinese or in uh, in Cantonese, it sounds like death. So in some of the Hong Kong buildings, you don't see floor four, floor fourteen, floor twenty-four. You don't see those. So if you really want to heavily target at Hong Kong people, that's something you probably want to bear in mind. And the other thing very interesting about Hong Kong buyers is, is they are very um, sensitive about uh, certain type of property. They call them xiong zhai. Um, in, in English, it's Somebody has already died in that building, uh, in that apartment, or in the building. Whether it's a natural cause, or suicide, or murderer, that's a big no-no.、Um, so if you're building a new build development, that's fine. But they don't like the place, the land that you, that you, you use, have you know was a cemetery or next to a cemetery, or you know a, a hospital. You know, you know things associated with death. They really don't like. And with the superstitious like feng shui thing,、um, I think it's half half.、Um, half of the Hong Kong buyers, especially the older generations, they, they they still believe in feng shui quite a lot. But with the new generations, they're more open mind to it. And with the Taiwanese buyers,、um, they are quite heavily in feng shui as well.、Um, number thirteen is not good number for Taiwanese. Number four again is not good number for the Taiwanese. For mainland Chinese. Um, you know, we have quite a lot of our individual feng shui thing. Like for example, your your apartment、um, shouldn't be at the crossroad. That's bad. Chi, you don't gather the fortune.、Um, place near water is good. <laughs>、um, in Chinese, we say if the if the apartment、uh, the back、um, against the hill, you have water in the front. That's really good because、um, you have. A very strong person, like strong strength behind you, supporting you, and then you have water. That's money. Water represents money, so that's good. And also, you know, needs to be square. We don't like funny shape of the units. So, if you go into that, there's going to be quite a lot. So, my advice is, you know, we are in the UK market. So, you know, the balance, the balance is quite important. You can just do a little detail to show some, you know, you understand the culture, but you don't have to over the top do everything. Yeah, I can remember being involved in a development in West London some years ago, which was on the、um, the, the old site of a hospital, 
and we had terrible resistance from the sort of Asia Pacific areas over that. They just didn't want to, you know. The moment they found out it was a sort of hospital site, it caused it caused a real problem. I I'm the same, you know. Me and my husband, even my dog, we were like this as well. Like there was once we went to visit a, a property ourselves. We went in and I just I just feel cold and my dog starts barking. I was like, oh, and we went back, we did the research that used to be a hospital for Second World War soldiers. Then I was like, you know, maybe this is in my blood. But then I have a lot of common language with my buyers and my sellers. So I understand the culture. Perhaps, so perhaps we ought to be renting out your dog to developers to give them a clue as to, as to where. Yeah, he needs to earn his uh, dog food money, right? <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. I don't suppose you've got a lot to add to this, Richard. <laughs> <laughs> well, only that it's just really interesting. Yeah. Um, I was born on a Friday the thirteenth, so I'm in big trouble, clearly. Right. Um, but I think you know, from a developer's point of view, what harm would it do just to, as you say, show an understanding and appreciation and respect, but also what harms it do to not include the number four? It's not going to be the end of the world. Um, maybe Royal Mail and the, the PATH uh, <laughs> information might, might find it, uh, it might cause problems genuinely. Um, I mean, I, I other could, than that, no, I could think not. of a lot of developments here that, you know, take the English superstitions like your Friday the 13th. I could, I, there's a lot of developments and quite a few down here that jump from floor 12 to 14, surprisingly yeah. enough. Yeah. Um, which. You state, say, you've seen it in the States for, yeah. for, for decades, yeah, yeah, same thing. Great, well, thank you for that insight, no uh, Sally. Great stuff. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, Richard, I have a small buy-to-let portfolio of properties, including two HMO units. I'm constantly trying to find competent managing agents who I find in general are good at some things and not so good at others. In other words, finding a competent, comprehensive service is proving difficult. Would the panel recommend that I undertake part of the management personally by purchasing or leasing software systems to limit the need for agents, or at least in part? I, I would not recommend part managing a property. I think there's, uh, there's a potential for, for confusion, for the potential of, of assuming that one party has done something like a gas safety certificate or a, a PAT testing. It could be anything. But when you look at a compliance heavy industry like the UK lettings market, and I was thinking about this this morning, um, you know, if you start to go through the list of everything that needs to be done on a property, you know, even something like a, a risk assessment for, for Legionnaire's disease. You know, if you've got radiators with standing water, you have to have a risk assessment completed. Um, it, you know, it might be something like that that you either overlook or assume, which I think will be the dangers of taking on all or part of it. Um, there is some landlord software out there. It's pretty basic, usually kind of very low cost or free free entry level. Um, from a, a, a from our perspective, as a company that provides agency software, um, I'm maybe a bit biased, but I also see the other side of it. You know, go, move on from the uh, electrical installation certificates and. Uh, 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 the, the, the tagging your furniture for uh, you know, for, for fire mm -hmm. safety. Sure. Um, you know, I, I could go on and on. You've then got to think about other compliance like uh, rent deposit protection, uh, AML, right to rent checks. I mean, it, there's such a lot of, of compliance now um, that I, I would always recommend using using an agent. I think the problem this this particular question poses is, Find, how do I find the right agent? Um, I would recommend a lot of our clients are members of Arla, Arla Property Mark. So uh, that's a, a group that is uh, you can join, you can become a member of. Uh, your your staff will will undertake a minimum level of CPD every year. Um, you're continually educated, therefore, and your staff are continually educated. They provide great guidance and advice on legislation and upcoming legislation. We've got rent reform coming soon. Another reason to use an agent because there's going to be a lot of new legislation coming in next spring. Um, just to put it into context, I think it is just under 50% of England's PRS properties are managed by an ARLA member. Mm. That's well, 2.2 million properties. Yeah. There are 10,200 branches who are members of ARLA. 
So my point would be you will not have to go too far to find uh, an ALA member. Can I also add something as well, Stephen? Sure. Because our landlords or international buyers, um, I find what is very useful is um, have a, a conversation, a FaceTime conversation with them. I would advise every single landlord, if you can, do that. Before you entrust your property to an agent, to mm. a stranger, uh, mm. don't just go with the ALA qualification. We are ALA well, qualified. Don't just go with ALA qualification. Go with the people who actually is looking or which team are looking after your property. Talk to them. The old style, old fashioned way, I wouldn't entrust my own property to somebody who claim to have Allah, have a good system, but this person doesn't have responsibility. I need to know the person or the team who look after my property really will look after my property. I need to talk to them. Maybe only, you know, the first time before I instruct, I talk to them, I have a feeling, and then I just leave it be. So I would recommend every landlord, if you are, you know, especially you're not professional landlord, you're worried about something, and then have an initial conversation, ask all the questions, especially with the Singaporeans. Our Singaporean landlords, they are very good at this. And we have our main, uh, majority of our landlords, they are mainland Chinese or Hong Kong. Um, I would say maybe five to 10% are Sing Singaporeans. Every time they call us, every time is over an hour. They ask every single question down to little details. How long are you gonna do the TDS? What is TDS? What's gonna yeah, happen yeah. If, we, if you don't put into TDS? What if the tenant doesn't pay rent? And then we go through all their questions and John really loves it. John said, you know, it's clients like this keep us on our toes. Absolutely. They yeah, keep yeah. checking, yeah. they keep checking. You, yeah. You're talking about really doing your due diligence on yeah. those agents. Yeah. I just think when, if there's, a, if there's a doubt, checking things like, are they ALA members? It does yeah. show yeah. that there is um, the first the screening, intention. Yeah. You know, there's a, there's, a, there's a desire to yeah. get things right. Because yeah. they're paying yeah. for that membership, yeah. of course. Yeah. They're paying yeah. for that, that yeah. CPD. Yeah, they get trainings, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I think that's, that's, that would be one piece of advice. I think absolutely talk to them, get to know yeah. them, build yeah. a relationship. Yeah. And you're yeah. going to find with UK agents, yeah. we're a, they're a personable bunch. They actually yeah. will yeah. be happy to talk. Yeah, exactly. You know, they they yeah. walk in offices. I mean, it's, yeah. they're, they're very open to a conversation. Yeah. But like, on a sobering note, I mean, it, we've seen in the property press this week, I mean, non-compliance with regulations, particularly in the case of HMO units, mm can cost you tens and tens of thousands of pounds in fines if you don't get it right. Yeah. It's very important. And, and, and again, that adds a further complexity to this particular person's portfolio. So HMO, you know, in certain areas with certain local authorities will have a license scheme. Add a further complexity in that that may differ, or the requirements may differ from local authority to local authority. So you, you, you know, you, you've now got, with everything we've just discussed there, with all the compliance and the, yeah. and, and the legislation, and, and HMO, you know, you've got a, a minefield of potential pitfalls for that landlord. Yeah. That's why I would recommend an agent. I think, I think we have to accept that renting today is, is a very serious business and should really be undertaken by professionals. Yeah. I couldn't agree more. But there we are. That's all we've got time for in this half of the show. So join me again after the break when we'll be back with uh, Sally and Richard. Hello and welcome back to part two of Property Question Time with uh, Sally Wang and Richard Murray. So Sally, your second question. Mm -hmm. I am a resident in Shanghai and own a property in London which is let out through an agent. My tenant, however, has not paid his rent for months. My agent simply suggests that I should take him to court. I am, however, worried that I am not in the UK and this may be very difficult and a time-consuming process. Do the experts have any advice as to what alternatives may be available to me? Mm. Unfortunately, we're not talking about many alternatives here. Um, if the tenant didn't pay the rent, then, you know, the first thing maybe your agent can help you to do is to start a friendly a balanced conversation, not friend, not not only friendly but forceful as well. Um, need to have a very close communication with the tenant, and then try to get the rent out of them. Try to understand why they're not paying rent. So for our, for example, our agent, we will literally at this point we will go and knock on the door, and try to speak to them. But then of course, if they refuse to open the door, we can't do nothing about it. But we will have the conversation standing outside this door and try to talk to them. Why you don't pay rent? Do you know the consequences of this? Your credit will get um, bad impact. 
uh, we will bring you to the courts. You will be evicted. And so we will start the conversation, try to get through. If this still doesn't get through to the tenant, let's say the tenants, you know, things happen. Maybe they get divorced, maybe they lose their job, maybe they got illness, they just can't pay. Then the only way um, to get them out is through the legal procedures. And it is time consuming. Um, but if you have a good agent, then the agent should be you know, handling it um, for you. But you need to mentally and psychologically prepare for this ordeal as well. But then if you do solve these problems in the end, my advice is next round when you find a tenant. You need to be very, very careful from the very initial stage when you're screening the tenant credit check. Not just check the, not just rely on the third party credit check reference company. Look at their bank accounts. Ask your agent to check their three months, maybe three months bank accounts. Not if, if you find, you know, they're on a self-employee, they set up a company, maybe check the company's, you know, accounts, have a, have a look at the company history. For example, we used to have a tenant, we declined them because he said, this person said he he's a, a, he's a company owner, he earns this, this amount of money. The company was set up in 2015. We went on company house, very simple. The company only, was only set last year. So, you know, but this person produces three years of a company account. So that's fake. People, you know, there's quite complicated uh, internet now. Um, or the website you can create, uh, you can forge documents quite easily and they look really real. So do uh, not just rely on the third party uh, credit check, do some uh, research yourself as well. Ask your agent, did you meet with the, the tenant? What do you think? The first impression, you know, get more information about it and then do the thorough screening, put the tenants in, but in the meanwhile, maybe take on the landlord insurance, the rental insurance, maybe considering taking that as well. So at least you get some protection. But before you take on the rental insurance, look into the little details as well, what they cover, what they don't cover. Um, you know, do they cover the legal costs? Um, do they cover after the tenancy expire, but the tenant's still leaving the property? So you got to check all these little details. Unfortunately, um, you know, if the economy is not good and things change, the coverage, you know, um, the risk is is out there. But in the meanwhile, you know, you are profit. Take this as a business as well. You are a landlord. You know, this is investment. Take it as a business. Um, you know, do things to avoid the problems. But when a problem comes along, don't get too frustrated. Try not to get too frustrated. Yeah. Do, do you think that since COVID, the um, communication between landlord and tenant has got better? Mm. I, the landlord, um, usually the landlord and the tenant, if you use a professional agent, they don't have a direct dialogue. Mm. It's usually through the agent. Mm. And I think during the COVID, yes, I think definitely the communication between the tenant, agent, between the landlord, both sides are getting improved because, you know, we, we, we need the communication to get things done because most of the time we don't say them in person. Mm. So if you need to get a problem solved or, or do a little bit of work, you need to improve your communication, not only the skills, but also the software they're using as well. Yeah. 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 And just final question for you on that. Um, do you think do you think that it's better? I, I, I mean, maybe I'm a little bit old fashioned now, but I I was always taught that if if you start to have a rental problem, if somebody doesn't start to address it right there and then, don't let it run. Exactly. Yeah. You know? Yes, Stephen, that's a very good point. Uh, when the tenant behind the rent for a couple of days. That's the time the agent should already start calling them, hmm. email them. Um, what's going on? Maybe they just, it's a glitch. Maybe it's a system. Maybe the direct debit is wrong. Um, but then you got to start the conversation as early as possible. Um, you can't really let it drag for three months. That's, that's very bad. The tenant will be thinking, oh, it's, it's, it's okay for me not to pay the rent. It's okay for me to do. It's not, you know, landlord, um, that's a lot, you know, they work hard for that money. Well, they may have yeah. mortgage commitments. They have a mortgage, you know, inflation is going. Everybody's got their responsibilities, you know, you've you got to do your duty, yeah. So I'm presuming, Richard, your software could pick this um, rental arrears up at, a, at an instant and uh, raise a red flag, could it? Straight yeah, away, yeah, yeah. automated yeah, yeah. as well. Um, we, we bespoke our automation, but I have clients who literally at one minute past midnight if the if the tenant is in arrears at 9 a.m. the next morning, they get a text message. Is that what Sally's that. saying? Yeah, we have that. Just yeah. to make sure that 
as Sally said, you're constantly doing things at the right time as soon as you possibly can. COVID presented more problems. It was very difficult, almost impossible to evict anyone. Yeah. So we built in payment plans. So again, as Sally was saying, if you're communicating well, whilst maintaining the, the information and the note taking and everything you might need for a, an eviction down the line, at least then if you need to go to a payment plan, we built that into our software, which seemed like a sensible thing to do at the time. Yeah, I, I, I recommend using that because we use that system because your mind can only remember certain things. You do need to rely on system to remind you that, yeah. Well, I th I, do you know what? I think the earlier that you address these problems, actually, you save a lot of unpleasantness later down the line. Yeah. Because, you know, one of the classic answers you get, well, well, why didn't you tell me about this a couple of weeks ago? You didn't yeah. tell me you were bothered. Yeah, yeah. Or... But the, the messaging has to be right as well. Mm. And it's yeah. that, you know, just might be, how, is it an oversight? It may be yeah. an oversight, um, but you haven't paid your rent as you would normally yeah. be expected to do mm. on the date. And, it, and again, yeah. the whole process can be, can be, be put in place. And then there's a record within the within the yeah. software. I think, I think, I think yeah. a day, that a day was made at that yeah. time on that date by that. Yeah, so if you user do have to go automated. to the court, then you have a black and white. You have a notes. You have a timeline. Absolutely. Yeah. A day one text is absolutely ideal, isn't it? You know. But anyway, there we are. Okay, um, Richard. Moving on to your question. Do the panel think that the current trend of estate agents using and relying on more and more sophisticated software? and property portals will see an increase in online only agents, negating the need for the traditional high street shop window. If so, do the panel think this is necessarily a good thing? Well, I, I've sort of, I've gone on the record a number of times to, to say that I just don't understand the business model of an online agent. I, I don't understand, I didn't understand it at the time. I still don't understand it now and, and no one's explained it to me in a way that it makes any sense to me. However, um, my personal opinion is, is that the, the traditional agency model will be maintained. Um, online agents came into the market in a, in a significant way around 10 years ago. So Purple Bricks was founded in 2012. Um, there was other, others hatched and other, other companies who had, who had sort of been the, the trailblazers for, for online agency. And there's a place for it. However, the massive disrupting, disruption of the industry that, that these businesses were expecting didn't happen and hasn't happened. So when they were expecting between 25, taking 25 to 50% of the, of the market and it's closer to five, 10 years down the line, that says something to, to me, that says there's something not quite right with the business model. Um, I think local expertise is something that I don't think we can really reproduce in a in a piece of software, in a platform. We can produce all sorts of stats and data, but as a technology person, it might sound like a strange thing to say, but you can't beat a person then communicating that brilliant data, that well, evidence to, a, to, a, to another person. We've, we've heard some excellent advice from an agent today, Sally. She's come up with some great pieces of advice yep. and comment on, on, on the market. How on earth do you get that by either ticking boxes or just looking at an online portal. I mean, you just can't do it. I don't think so. I think, I think self-service will become more a part of things, which will help the agents. So we were talking about tenants, for example, there, just you know, allowing them to put their own data into a system, for example, mm. whether it's referencing or whatever it might be. There's amazing technology now that will um, spot any fake ID, any fake documentation, no matter how accurate or how well mm. forged it is, there's technology out there that will 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 deal with that. Open banking. So you talked about getting the bank statements for three months. Well, open banking will do that job for you. It will it will automatically tell you can this person afford th this rent. Oh, it's not that. What can uh, they afford? Can they afford more? It's it's not that. When we look at the bank uh, statement, it's not about whether they can afford it. We're looking at spending habit as well. But that's all. Uh, you open can access can all of that. that. Open banking can do all of that because okay. it it won't tell you that they've bought overspent on ice cream last month, but it, it will give you in, 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 income and expenditure and, and, and will allow you to understand how, that, you know, what their affordability factors are. So it overcomes the problem you were worried about before and rightly worried about a recently formed company and someone who's faked uh, three years worth of accounts, which is the typical requirement, right? Um, but there's technology coming and already out there that is, is going to make a, a huge impact 
a huge impact in this in these sorts of areas. I mean, I can, I, I, I can see that um, online, for instance, works very well if you're selling cars or watches or so, something like that. But when you when you're dealing with such an individual product as a, as a home, a house, an apartment, or a particular situation in real estate, then you need the comfort of having experts around you. The, the, the expert knowledge that these people can provide. And this is what online cannot do. But then you've got successful models in, you know, around the world, like the Zillow model in the, in the States, with a you know, for sale by owner you know, type, type model. I just think, we talked about culture earlier, didn't we? And, and, I, and I just think culturally, I think the UK are just, we're not yet prepared we're to let there. go of that. No. That it's our biggest, you know, most of us, it'll be the biggest transaction we're ever involved in. You know, by far. Yep. And I think to, to put that onto a platform and to trust technology to do all that for us, I think culturally there's a, there's a blocker there. Well, you're right with the culture because, I mean, ha how many times have we seen American ideas come over here and fail and UK ideas go over to the States and fail over there? And, I mean, on, online agency based in the UK is one that's failed yep. in the UK. And yeah. So far, yeah. In the so USA. Far. Yeah. And also casually with the Asian, the Chinese buyers, um, is. Most of the buyers are actually women um, in the family. And you know women in the technology, I'm slow with the technology. So we like to have a cup of tea, have a nice lunch. And then we, we talk about property, we, we talk about the rental. And then, you know, I like this person, I like doing business with this person, I trust her. Then, you know, I can continue doing what I do, make more money, buy more properties, you know, buy more things. So that's that's culture, as you said, it's culture. Well, there we are. So, well, I do hope that you enjoy being on our show as much. Yeah, yeah I do. <laughs> Good. Um, okay, so founder of SJW International, Sally Wang, thank you very much for coming Pleasure. in today. And uh, Richard Murray, CEO of Euralink, thank you for coming in. Great answers to the questions, great advice. Thank you very much indeed. I'm Stephen Galvin. I look forward to seeing you next time on Property Questions.